Amen. All right, so last week we went through the gospel, if y'all remember. So we're in week nine now, and I had uh, a fellow who's not been coming here, but um, I guess he's been paying attention. So we asked if, are we going to do the resurrection? And I said, yeah, we have a, we have a lesson on that. So we're going to do, tonight is going to be entrusted with the message of hope which uh, is peppered throughout the New Testament. Hope, hope, hope. Um, so we're going to go there. And so we, uh, we talked about the Son, the incarnation of the Son, why He came, uh, and that being carried on, that belief being carried on throughout history amidst lots of um, controversy, difficulty, false teachings, etc. And then last week we talked about the Gospel. So what did the Son do for us? Well, he, he uh, gives us salvation through belief in his name, right? Went to the cross for us, took on, our, took on all of our sin. Talked about that last week. Um, and he also accomplished what will be our eternal life. Through the, his resurrection, we will also be resurrected. In fact, everyone will, and there'll be a judgment. But uh, for those who are in Christ, who've expressed their faith in Christ, who've become um, believers, who've been regenerated, who have the presence of the Holy Spirit in them, we will have eternal life. So we're going to walk through hope. We're going to talk about that tonight. And we're going to go mostly through, just through Scripture. And then we'll look at how it's been, this message been conveyed throughout the history of the church. So we'll look at some of those statements. And they'll be very encouraging statements. Um, why is it important that we even think about this? Why is it important that we know this and talk about this? Life is hard. <laughs> Life is hard. And some days you need to tell yourself, and some days other people need to tell you, and some days you need to tell other people about the hope that's to come. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you said hope, we, we, we have a tendency as believers sometimes to look at the world and look at the way people behave, and, you know, the pursuits of the flesh and what's order. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, anybody knows what I'm talking about. I'm not going to enumerate all the different ways that people sin and fall short of the glory of God, but you can't really blame them. If they have no hope of, of where are we going after this life? We are probably one of the few animals, if you want to call them that, in this world <laughs> that knows that we had a beginning and we will have an end. We know we're going to die sooner or later. Those of us in here, we know that after we die, there's going to be the judgment. Mm -hmm. But for us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that means that we're going to heaven. The rest of them, they don't know what they're going to do. Well, I've heard people say, well, this is hell on earth. No, it ain't. <laughs> it ain't even close. It may be rough, but it ain't that bad yet. You know, and, and they, it's like the Apostle Paul said. If there is no resurrection, eat, drink, and be married, because tomorrow we're going to die. That's it. You know? <laughs> I don't understand how anybody can be a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim. I mean, that, that's yeah. really the, that's the worst of it. Because if you're going to commit suicide and kill people with you, basically commit murder, then you might get to heaven. You might. You still don't get to it. That's just, that's just crazy. But anyway... That, that's, that's the whole message of, of Christ coming. We have a life after this one, and it is an eternal life in a much better place. The much better life. Yeah. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people, when they share the gospel, of all the, okay. case, of all the faiths out there, there's, there's salvation, but there's also um, justice, right? Like, there is wrong in this world, and it doesn't go unpunished. And mm -hmm. not Christ bore that punishment for us. But like, we're, we've been created to want justice. It's woven in us, and so it's, you know, it's the only faith that, you know, actually provides that, you know, uh, that, uh, I mean, and I, you know, I think like the apostle said, to whom shall we go, Lord, you have the, the yeah. words of eternal life. 
And, and the problem that we run into too with our finite minds is that we confuse justice and vengeance. Whereas in, in, with us, we know that we have a God who will take care of us. He will set the, the, the whole the scale of life. Yeah. We don't have to. He'll take care. He'll take care of us. And that's, you know, the glories. Well, we'll walk through this and hopefully to be encouraging to you just to think about it, you know, for the next 45 minutes or so, just to think about it. And then hopefully it'll, it'll also uh, uh, provoke you to, um, what do we do with this? Not just think about it, about it being, boy, this is great. But what do we do about it? Um, here is um, how it's expressed in the Baptist faith and message. So most statements of faith have something to say about the, the last times, the summation of, of God's plan. Uh, so here's the ba fat <clears throat> Baptist faith and message. God in his own time and his own way will bring the world to its appropriate end. <laughs> its appropriate end. According to his promise, Jesus Christ will return personally and visibly in glory to the earth. Because an essential truth is um, that uh, he will bodily return. He is still the incarnate Son of God. Uh, the dead will be raised, and Christ will judge all men in righteousness. The unrighteous consigned to hell, the place of everlasting punishment. No mincing words there. Um, the righteous in the resurrected and glorified bodies will receive their reward and will dwell forever in heaven with the Lord. So that's how the, that's how uh, um, Baptists determined in their latest uh, expression of this to express it. Well, what does the Bible say? So we're going to walk through the biblical revelation of this message of hope, and we're going to look at different promises that are in the hope of uh, what Christ has accomplished and what is coming, what has not been seen yet, but what's been revealed in Scripture. So in the Old Testament, hope is expressed in the faith of God's unseen promises. You read Hebrews chapter 11, and you see all those things that, that, um, that uh, the different uh, people of, of God in the Old Testament uh, place their faith in, yeah, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And then it wraps up with this, they have not seen it yet. But, and we'll, we'll look at that passage in a minute. Um, in the New Testament Gospels, Jesus unfolds the hope of the coming kingdom, the hope of the resurrection, the hope of eternal life. Um, you read the Gospels and, and continually He's saying things about that. Why he has come. What the promises are for those who believe in him. In the New Testament epistles and the book of Acts, the proclamation of hope is present in evangelism. So as a gospel message is being shared, there's hope in that message. There's a, a, a expressions of that. And in believer instruction. So those in Christ are reminded over and over and over again about the hope of the resurrection, about the hope of eternal life. Um, and it's done purpose, purposefully because it hasn't happened yet. Um, and so what do we do while we're waiting is one question. And in the early church, and then forward throughout time, and I'm going to show you some examples of this, Expectation of the fulfillment of God's promises is pervasive. It's brought up again and again and again by different writers in different confessions with encouraging words and also the reality of, of judgment day, of judgment. So that happens. But in the early church, they really thought it was imminent. Just as the uh, apostles were asking Jesus before he ascended, is now the time? Um, but throughout the early church, they really thought it was coming soon. They really thought it was going to happen soon. Um, 
And in part because of that, they were willing to sacrifice their lives for the sake of the gospel. So that's in the scripture. Here's six categories of promises that have to deal with the hope that we have in, in, uh, in the summation of all the times. The promise of Christ's return, the promise of the resurrection, the promise of the kingdom of God, the promise of ultimate righteousness, the promise of glory, and the promise of eternal life. So we're going to look at scriptures for each one of these and kind of think about them. So first of all, while it seems like a long, long wait, we're still waiting for Christ to return. We're still waiting for that. Been waiting, uh, the church has been waiting for nearly 2,000 years now for him to return. When's that going to happen? And it's really easy for the for the ones in his day and, and right after he ascended, it was relatively easy for them to think about it because they were expecting his return. But as time goes on, and we've never met him, we've never seen him, it's easy for believers to kind of forget to think about him. And remember that, oh yeah, he's going to return. That's going to happen. Or even be misled and believe that he's already returned. <laughs> yep. Or try and set the date, <laughs> which happens quite often. Um, but we might, have, we, we might have missed something by not stoning false prophets. <laughs> oh, I think. There's several religions out there that wouldn't be here right now if we just. Uh, oh, I think going back to what Mr. Mason said, you know, the Lord's going to deal with all that, right? Um, yeah. Our. Ours is to proclaim the gospel, the true gospel. So anyway, let's look at some scriptures to talk about it. And these scriptures hopefully are encouraging because it will, you know, if you look at these, it will remind you of this truth. Christ is returning. So here's Acts 1 9. Uh, here's the kickoff. And after he, Christ, had said these things, he was lifted up while they were watching, and a cloud took him up and out of their sight. I love this part. Um, and as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, because they had just asked the question about when's he going to return? So they're staring, right? Then behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? What? Get moving. This Jesus who has been sent, who's been, who has been taking up, taken up from you into heaven will come, will come in the same way as you've watched him go into heaven. He's going to return. It's promised. He said it. They're reminding them that this is going to happen. And so that shows up in different places in the epistles, in the writings of the New Testament. Here's one. Here's 1 Peter. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Set your hope completely hope, that word el, elpida. Every time you see hope in the New Testament, that's the word, elpida, hope. Set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ when he returns. Um, and what is Peter saying that they should be doing in expectation of his return? How should believers be behaving? What should they be doing? Prepare your minds for action. What has Christ given you to do? Do that. Keep sober in spirit. Um, keep focused. Don't let things in the world distract you from, from this, from staying focused on Him. And, uh, and remember, this is true. This is not a, oh yeah, yeah, is, oh gosh, I haven't thought about that lately. And Titus, Paul's letter to Titus, live sensibly, righteously, 
and in a godly manner in the present age. This is how you're to live while you're waiting. Because no one knows when it's going to happen. It may not happen in our lifetime. We may be one of those who's, who's fallen asleep, waiting for, him, waiting for the time when he returns. So sensible, righteous, godly, in the present age, in the present time, looking, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we continue to serve Him. We continue to think about Him as we're waiting for Him to return because it's promised. It's been promised in Scripture that He's coming back. The day has not been promised. That was before the apostles were looking and they talked with Jesus and asked Him, when are you going? Not, the not for you to know the time of the day. Not for you to know when. Um, but the promise is He is returning. So while it seems like a long, long wait, there is hope. Live for Him and as if His coming is any day now. Even though the Bible gives different signs of the return, even Jesus said some of them, but no one knows. And it could be any day. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, depending on, uh, depending on what you mean by live for him, but it's going to be a day now. Um, like, I mean, that can be taken to a wild extreme, which I think has been done significantly. In this yeah. Yeah. So, for instance, to quote Jonathan Edwards, when asked the question, what would you do if you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow? But his answer was, I'd plant a tree. Right? So, I mean, but blessed is the man that, that leaves uh, an inheritance to his children's children. Right? So, I mean, I mean, I obviously don't disagree inherently with the question or with the statement. Right. Uh, I just want to put caution at the end. Yeah. Well, um, so, yeah, so. I think what's confusing is that we are to live for him as if his coming is at any day, but that does not mean we don't plan for the future. You and I have children, and in my case, grandchildren. Right. And we do yeah. plan for those children. I do plant trees, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I know that even though I may not be around to, to enjoy the fruit of those trees, my children may be. But if not, if Christ does come back, then that's okay too. Yep. I've done what I need to do now for Christ and plan for the future as well. You don't right. ignore, you don't. The, the implication though is if he's coming tomorrow, that then tomorrow is as far into the future as you need to plan. No, because there's other scriptures in there that warn people about that kind of attitude because well, some, of that's, them, that's some, some, some of them had gone so far they wasn't even working anymore. It, oh, he's coming for us. I'm going to sit around here and have a good time with him. Like to hear that kind of thing. Yeah, that's precisely my point. Yeah. That, that's exactly the same thing that you're talking about there. We have to be careful not to carry it to an extreme. I agree with you. Yeah. I may not have come across that way, but I do. But we want to be found faithful. That's it. All right? We don't want to, we don't want to drift. We don't want to make... Um, we don't want to make... Uh, other things are greater, a greater priority than, than serving him faithfully. Yeah, I mean, you got the, the parable of the ten virgins. Like, yeah, I mean, don't, don't, be, don't be a lazy virgin. Yeah. You know, Peter's, Peter's warnings at, at, at the end of his letter. So, um, not that we say, okay, I'm going to expect it's tomorrow. So, you know, I'll quit doing, any, I'll quit doing everything. But it's a, no, I'm just aware that he's, I'm where the promise is coming back. And oh, by the way, I desire for that. Um, but I'm going to be faithful. I just wonder if the moral is very much focused to shame when it comes to being prepared for the end. I mean, the, the 12 virgins, right? There's the ones that had the oil and they had enough. The other ones had some. So I don't think it's strictly talking about faith because you can't have, you either have faith or you don't. You might have half a portion, but it's not going to last. Maybe. Almost have faith or something, but you know, materially, like half of them were prepared and half of them weren't. Yes, I mean, Jesus 
there's some less yeah. piece of one that lasts to the end, right? Yeah, you, you talk about Mormons, and you have to ask yourself, do you believe you're going to go to heaven or not? Well, I think, I think <laughs> his, his point is simply that they're they are prepared. Yeah. Which, which is, I mean, I Jesus Christ so, is the Pharisees. You, you travel land and sea to make a single convert, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's a backhand counter, right? He's saying, like, like, yeah, I mean, they are on a mission. Yeah. But when they get there, they can repeat what's on heaven. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. But, I mean, also the Mormons, like, stockpile a year they do. of food. Yeah. I've, I've known them some. They, they, they were required to keep a year's worth of water and food on, on hand. Yeah. Um, but, but that was from Louisiana. I love that you take that to me. And if you, if you believe that we won't be spared from the tribulation, like, you know, everything else, God's people have to go through the fire, not the fire of hell, but, you know, the trials. If you go to believe we're going to go through the tribulation and everybody's going to be hiding in rocks and, like, you know, maybe bunkers in Texas, but, you know, it's kind of, uh, I wonder about the, you know, how well we'll fare compared to some others that spiritually should be prepared for it. Well, and even if it's not Christ returning, but we're going to sleep, car accident or something, we still have to live every day planning for the future, but also being prepared to see Jesus face to face that Could day. You, you don't know if you're going to fall over from a heart attack. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, Actually, I've had in the road. not for five years at least. Oh, it's good to know. Well, let's just go back to Titus, right? Living, live sensibly, righteously, and in a godly manner. Looking for the blessed hope. It's that simple. He's coming. It's that simple. Don't live arrogantly like you're just going to keep on living. Be aware. You see, I'd like to, instead of living a crazy life and then going, ooh, it might be tomorrow, I'm going to straighten up. I think I, sadly, my tendency would be the other way of I'm going to go eat everything that I eat in moderation right now and go crazy because tomorrow he's coming and yeah. I have to be careful of going the other extremes. But don't you think that's why you didn't tell us when he was coming? Yes. I mean, that's why I think about it. There, there's a lot of things throughout history and through the Old Testament stuff like, where's Moses' body? We have no idea. God took him away so we wouldn't have some kind of altar somewhere to some Right, where we could go and pray and we never wanted it. So Yeah, and then you know, like where's the Ark of the Covenant? People began to worship the Ark instead of God. I mean, so it's about grit. You know, it depends yeah. on where you believe. It's actually, good not to have the date. You know, so we don't we don't know. We, we're not told these things because as human beings, it would be our tendency then to do exactly what you're talking about. Live while I'm down because I can I can repent today and tomorrow morning can take it away. Well, the, the, yeah, so, yeah, so, so we got, we got to get it through, get it through, but, but uh, perhaps, perhaps think of it this way. Um, do you, um, uh, is there a part of you that, uh, that desires for his return? I mean, do you, do you, yeah, right? And no matter if it doesn't happen tomorrow or the next day or next week or, a thousand years from now, there's still that, there's still that desire for him for him to return because you know what he's done for us and the promise is he's coming back. And uh, and you should hope for the fulfillment of that promise. In the meantime, you want to live faithfully, right? And the hope of his return, the hope of what's coming, should encourage you to live faithfully. In a time where it's easy not to. It also pushes for evangelism because for sure we think, oh, maybe tomorrow, maybe today, we can all order a phone book or. Well, see, that's where I was pissed at. What is the one thing that, that in your mind holds you back to say, come right now? Loved ones that don't know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not our, it's not our choice as to when he comes. No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Promise of the resurrection. So Genesis 6, you mentioned death, death, death. So Genesis 6 is, is the uh, 
uh, is the book in scripture where it goes to goes to the genealogy of a lot of people, lives this many years, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. Result of the fall brought death. But in Christ, but in Christ, here's Paul in Acts. Um, this message, is, this passage got preached on a few weeks ago. Uh, Paul began crying out in the council. He's before the, the council, getting tried. He's getting ready to, you know, um, and they're trying to, Accuse him of every, all the things he did wrong in the temple. Brothers, I'm a Pharisee, a son of the Pharisees. I'm on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. And, and he mentions that promise other times when he's on trial. Um, when he said that dissension occurred between the Pharisees and Sadducees, the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees had no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. But Paul proclaims the resurrection. And we know 1 Corinthians 15, he proclaims, as you were saying, hey, without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. Um, so the resurrection, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. So Paul and Thessalonians, they're concerned that maybe they missed it. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep. That's the word that Paul uses for those that have died. So you will not grieve as indeed the rest of mankind do, who have no hope. So if you think this is it, and someone dies, and people moan and grieve because they're lost, they'll never see them again. Um, but Paul says, we don't do that. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, so also God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, through Jesus. So that's our great hope, is knowing that He's promised, God's promised the resurrection. He's promised that we will not stay dead. Promised the resurrection. And for those who are in Christ, that's good news. Um, for those who aren't in Christ, that's horrible news. Dead and alive, but then is the resurrection. Right. So when it gets later in life, or you're going through true suffering for the Lord, right? This hope is wonderful because when you age, when you start to, you know, to uh, your your physical body starts falling apart. When that happens, oh my goodness, the hope of the resurrection knowing that, hey, I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to death. I'm getting closer and closer to that reality that that's going to happen. But the hope of the resurrection, but someday when he returns, I don't have to, I, there's no need for me to fear that. Or even when I'm experiencing the reality of what's coming, right? The resurrection, um, suffering. Those who are suffering from Christ. If you have the hope of the resurrection um, and you're remembering that, so there's Paul, there's Paul in, in prison, Paul thinking he might die to be absent with the body, to be present with the Lord. Um, whether I'm taken away, I get to be with Christ. If I'm here, I'm here for you. But there's a reality of him knowing that at any moment he could be killed. I mean, he's getting beaten, he's getting um, shipwrecked, he's, he's got people that are, that are trying to kill him right after the interaction with Pharisees and Sadducees that are out to kill him. Um, yeah. Hmm? I mean, you got a bit of Yeah. But the hope of the resurrection. Think about that for a minute. The hope of the resurrection. Jesus promised, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. The hope of the resurrection. The time is going to come when the dead are raised, when those who are alive are raised. And from there, that promise of life eternal with God. And the resurrection is not only 
okay, this this decrepit, sinful body is going to be raised and it's going to live forever. No, transformed in a moment. I mean, the beauty of uh, you know a body that will that will live eternally, a body that will have no sin, a body that will glorify God forever. Yeah. So, but in Christ, there is hope. And we have the opportunity to comfort others with that truth. Those that are grieving, those that are facing great physical difficulty in life, suffering, those that are facing the reality of aging and nearing death, but the hope of the resurrection, that promise, that's going to be fulfilled, that we're promised that, and it's going to be fulfilled. The promise of the kingdom. Believers taught to expect, Acts 1, 6. When is it that you will be uh, returning the kingdom to Israel? And pray for, so the Lord's prayer that was taught, for the kingdom. And Jesus spoke about it. Back in Daniel, so this is a this is pre-revelation revealing of the things that are to come in the end. But the court will convene for judgment, and his dominion, he's talking about the beast, will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms and the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the empires will serve and obey him. So these foreshadowings in the Old Testament of the promise of what's to come as well, that that, uh, God will have the everlasting kingdom, and his saints will be in it for all eternity. Hebrews 12, 28 and 13, 14. Therefore, this this is after he's, he's, uh, so he's Hebrews 11, all the promises. Hebrews 12, uh, focused on, uh, um, on Christ. And therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, that's coming, Let's show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. His reign is coming. Well, he's sovereign now. But the kingdom, the kingdom that has no evil in it, right? Um, So there it is again telling us, knowing that is going to happen, knowing that the unrighteous will be judged, knowing that the righteous will be with the Lord forever, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, by which we offer to God an acceptable servant with reverence and awe, thinking about who He is and serving Him faithfully in the way He should be served. Then 13, 14, for here, right now, we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeing the city which is to come. And then we get those descriptions about it in Revelation 21 and 22, about what that's going to be like. It's coming, the promise of the kingdom. So we're taught to expect it in the Gospels and then also in some of the epistles. And we're taught to pray for it, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a prayer of expectation. And this is a bold hope amidst everything happening in the world today, which has been true since the fall. But we know what's happening now in our time. The atrophy, the entropy, the tyranny, the instability, um, and it's not like today is 
unique except for what's in the world today that's different from the past. But every age of the church has lived through this. Every, every age of the people of God has lived through this. This reality of all the evil in this world um, and all the shakenness, not the unshaken kingdom. But this is a bold hope. A bold hope that when Christ returns, all that will be over. There will be nothing like what we're living through right now. And isn't that hope a beautiful thing to think about? A wonderful thing to think about? The hope of the time when the unshaken kingdom will be present? But also remember, God is sovereign even now. God is sovereign even now. He's not asleep. He's not unaware of everything going on in, in His creation. He is still the king. He's still the one true God. He's not competing with these other empires and nations, governments. He's the one true God. But the unshaken kingdom is coming. So Christ is going to return. We have the hope of the resurrection. We have the promise of the kingdom and the promise of ultimate righteousness. And uh, for us, we have the challenge of we still de deal with sin. I mean, even the most godly person, whoever that is, still deals with sin, still has sin. This is true for everyone and true for every Christian, right? Every believer still have this struggle with sin. But the promise is that one, judgment will come in the end when Christ returns, judgment will happen and we will have no sin. We'll have a transformed body with no sin. No sinful thought, no sinful action, no sinful word. Isn't that a great hope? Mm -hmm. Thinking about how we actually do struggle with sin. <laughs> we say something, and, uh, we do something, and, uh, we think something. Uh, um, Galatians 5, 5. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. When will that day come? Often we think about others who are unrighteous. Lord, when will vengeance come? But we should also think about ourselves. And wanting to have, desiring to have, no sin. And through the Spirit by faith, that should be our thought. The hope of righteousness is it's coming. Personally and kingdom-wide. God is incredibly patient, isn't He? And long-suffering and gracious. Um, because some, some of us might have thought, let's do that plan differently. When I become a believer, let me not have this anymore. <laughs> or please take care of this in this situation or that person or with this part of the world, please. God's very long-suffering, patient, gracious, merciful. Romans 7.24, Paul declares this, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He knows it's going to come. He knows it's promised that righteousness will, will come, that he will no longer be a wretched man. Philippians 3.20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait. There is again, eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our lowly condition. Remember how we were created? How were we created? to be in the image of God, to glorify Him with every thought, every word, every action. And then as soon as Adam sinned, as soon as that thought of sin came to him, which was sin, that was all done. Not only for him, 
and for Eve, but for the whole human race. We eagerly await a Savior who will transform the body of our lowly condition into conformity with His glorious body. So when Jesus came, that's what they saw. That's what John 1 describes. They saw the Father. In His humanity, He was the image of God, just like we were created to be. Perfect, no sin. Perfect in every thought, every word, every action. And the promise is for us, in conformity with His glorious body, by the exertion of the power He has, even to subject all things to Himself. Guess what? That's coming. That's promised. Yes, um, we're being sanctified by the Spirit slowly. Slowly. We're being becoming more Christ-like, but nowhere even close to what it's going to be like when that's wiped out. Nowhere even close. There's hope. So look up as we strive to persevere, as we strive to be faithful, as we strive to, um, in our struggle with sin, as we strive to, in our prayers, um, in our relationships. But hey, the promise is for the ultimate righteousness. The wicked will be judged. Those who are in Christ will be found to be justified and no longer have this body of sin. Promise of glory. So here we go, created in God's image to display His glory and glorify Him. Sin corrupted that. Psalm 8, 4. What is man that you think of him, and a son of man that you were concerned about him? You made him a little lower than God, and you crowned him with glory and majesty. You have him rule over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. Of course, except that, you know, we're sinful. And Paul in Romans, for all have sinned, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and, and fall short of glorifying God as we're intended to do. All fall short of reflecting the glory of God and living in the image of God. Um, in Colossians 1.26, the mystery which has now been revealed to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what the wealth of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles is, the mystery that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope that when He returns and we've been transformed, we will glorify Him. We'll be restored back to being, living and being in the image of God. We will glorify Him for all eternity. There's hope. The restoration of glory at who we are intended to be and do and say and think, it's coming. And then eternal life. Though it may not physically feel like it, <laughs> we presently do have eternal life. And that promise is there for us. 1 John 5.10, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe in God uh, has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given concerning his son, who his son is, and why he came, and what he did. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Remember? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. So it's a reality, even though what it's going to be when He returns is not there yet. But the reality is true for us. Our eternal life started when we became, came to faith in Christ, when we were uh, renewed, regenerated. That's why the appeal carries with it. Okay, here's how you're to live. 
Here's how you're to live. Here's how you're to live. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Have eternal life. And then in John, uh, his, his gospel in John 20, look at the language, how similar it is. So that many other signs Jesus also performed, the presence of the disciples are not written in his book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So in his letter, in his gospel, there's the same thing, uh, the appeal um, to those who already believe and to those who John hopes will believe by reading his gospel and reading about who Christ is, John 1, what he did, what he said about himself, revealed about himself, that that would bring someone to faith in Christ. There is hope. So, <laughs> um, as you serve, as you age, as you bear suffering, remember you've got the promise of eternal life. And guess what? It's going to be incredibly different, unthinkably different. We've never been like Adam who walked with God and was sinless. We don't know what that's like. We have no concept of what, it, what it's like to not have a body of sin. Um, and he would have accept. Titus, uh, Paul's letter to Titus says, Is Paul a bond servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of the chosen of God, the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. This is true and real. But at the proper time revealed his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted, according to the commandment of God our Savior. So in Paul's message, in his teaching, in his instruction, part of his entrustment is this, is to remind them, inform them, teach them about the hope of eternal life. Later in Titus, but when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds with which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. He saved us, whom He richly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, again, not us, but through what Christ did, justified, we have been made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So Paul's wrapping up his letter to Titus, saying what he said at the beginning about the hope of eternal life that we have because of what Christ did for us. Here's the then, Luke 18, 29. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one, because the disciples had asked him, um, What about us? We've given up everything to follow you. There's no one who's left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now, he's not telling everybody to do this. He's just saying, if you've done it. So he's not saying, oh, by the way, leave everything behind and follow me. Uh, so, Matt, abandon your wife and kids. He's not, he's, that's not the message. But the disciples have given up a lot to follow him. Who will not receive many times as much as this time and in the age to come, eternal life. So don't worry about today or tomorrow, right? He said that in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't worry about today or tomorrow. But the promise of eternal life, the hope of eternal life. And now, John 10, 9, here's Jesus. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. The growing knowledge of who Christ is and what he's done makes our life more abundant, even amidst all the difficulties in our life and the, and the 
confusion and despair in the world? Because then he's coming back. So Christ is returning. We're going to be resurrected. The kingdom will be in. Um, we have the promise of glory. We have the promise of eternal life. All right. Here's a few expressions that we see throughout the ages of how it was expressed by different folks in different times. So we'll go post-apostle to, to the ancient church. Irenaeus, but when this present fa fashion of things passes away and man has been re re renewed and flourishes in an incorruptible state, so as to preclude the possibility of becoming old. <laughs> he was. Um, then there should be the new heaven and the new earth in which the new man will, shall remain continually, always holding fresh converse with God. Irenaeus thinking about when Christ returns. What's that going to be like? At the Council of Constantinople, we looked at this, right? That's where um, the, uh, uh, the full deity of Christ and the Holy Spirit were affirmed in that creed. Here's what the council said during that, those meetings. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom shall have no end. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So making statements to the church, making statements to the church as about what's to come with great hope. Here's the medieval period, the Middle Ages. John of Damascus, 740. We shall therefore rise again, our souls being once more united with our bodies, now made incorruptible and having put off corruption. So no more corruption of the body. No more corruption because of sin. Those who have done good will shine forth as the sun with the angels into life eternal. So done good as they've been justified. With our Lord Jesus Christ, ever seeing him and being in his sight, and deriving unceasing joy from Him, praising Him with the Father and the Holy Spirit through the limitless ages of ages. What a statement about what it's going to be like when Christ returns. Eternal life, the kingdom, kingdom of righteousness. St. Francis of Assisi, 500 years later, Thy kingdom come, that Thou shouldst reign with us with Thy grace, and let us come to thy kingdom, where we will see thee face to face, and have perfect love, blessed company, and simp eternal, which means everlasting, that's, a, that's an old middle-aged word, joy. Reformation. Here's the second Helvetic confession. So that's a statement of faith back in those days. So this is the late 1500s. Regarding the resurrection of the dead, we confess with the mouth and believe with the heart that according to the scriptures, okay, going back, you know, and what does the scripture say? All men shall have died or fallen asleep, will through the incomprehensible power of God at the day of judgment be raised up and made alive. And that the good or pious shall then further, as the blessed of the Father, be received by Christ into eternal life where they will receive that joy which I hath not seen, and it goes on, yea, where they shall reign and triumph with Christ forever and ever. So in, you know, into this confession, which is pretty long, they plant this seed of hope and re a reminder to their people that they're teaching this confession of, of what it's going to be like. Here's the Westminster Confession, a uh, century later, almost. At the last day, such as are found alive should not die, but be changed. And all the dead shall be raised up with the selfsame bodies. And none other, although with different qualities, so this is the removal of sin, right? Which will be united again to their souls forever. What are self-same bodies? Because it's going to be your body resurrected, right? But without sin. Yeah. Right. Transformed. Yeah, I don't know that for sure, but but 
but at any rate, um, the the body, the uh, our our bodies are transformed into this glorious body, right? Um, Jonathan Edwards, 1750, the souls of the righteous shall descend from heaven together with Christ and his angels. They shall be reunited to their bodies that they may be glorified with them. They shall receive their bodies prepared by God to be mansions of pleasure to all eternity. They shall be in every way fitted for the uses, the exercises, and delights of the perfectly holy and glorified souls. So prepare to do the things that God intends for them to do in eternity. With what joy will the souls and bodies of the saints meet, and with what joy they will lift up their heads out of the graves to behold the glorious sight of the appearing of Christ. Finally, we get to see Him. And here's Charles Spurgeon. Um, so he qualifies for the 150-year mark. Can all the saints put together fully measure the greatness of the promise of the second advent? So here he is thinking about this. Christ's return. Can you really put together and understand how great this is going to be? This means felicity for the saints. What else has he promised? Why? That because he lives, we shall live also. We shall possess an immortality of bliss for our souls. We shall enjoy also a resurrection of our bodies. We shall reign with Christ. We shall be glorified at His right hand. So there's Spurgeon thinking about and knowing that he can't completely comprehend it or think about it, but he's actively thinking about what it's going to be like when Christ returns. Um, I mean, that's a good practice. <laughs> yeah, well, they didn't have the Surgeon General to tell me in the day that that was not healthy to do. So, um, but so, what do we see through this? I mean, there's there's a continued throughout church history, a continued reflection, um, and put in ways that people could read and remember, and be taught or preached to about it, not ignored in the preaching, the teaching, the confessions. Um, and even though there is the reality of, the, of what's going to happen to the wicked, important to say that too, uh, to remind people who are concerned about when will justice be dealt with? When will sin be dealt with? But also to remind them of, of what you talked about, Billy, which is to be aware of, of them needing to hear the gospel. But the joy, the hope, so that we can be reflecting on that about our Savior and His return, the hope of His coming back, and all the dimensions of that that Scripture talks about. And we've just touched on a few of them. Um, yeah. I got excited digging these out and going, yeah, there's one, there's one, and there's a bunch of them throughout the history that are at least prevalent. There's probably a lot, but... <laughs> Didn't quite get that far along. Well, I appreciate at least what you told that they're detailed, but it's still, they're not going into heresy of too much detail because we're curious. I mean, there still is that question about, well, how does that work? But they're not yeah. answering those things. They're just leaving it to the public. Now, there's probably people who wrote about, here's some real specifics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of early writings that try and describe what the resurrection is like in detail. Because the question is being asked about, well, you know, if, if, what, about, what about the body that's been destroyed? And so they're trying to, right. yeah, they're trying to address those questions. Old, well, that's kind of a bummer if it's yeah. five. What's that? Scattered through the oceans, through various sundries. Right. 
donation was a really bad thing. Mm. And he never quite thought about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I was thinking that too. I think you're diminishing God's ability to hear a lot. Yeah, absolutely. But he was not a fan of organ, the organ donation. And he was like, well, I didn't know about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. 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 Lots of questions that people have and have had over over time. And it's okay that it's not. And good. and practices that today that weren't in other days. I mean it's yeah. that's gonna beg questions. Yeah. Um Yeah, I just like to focus on the hope of the resurrection. <laughs> It's important to think about think about decisions people make if, if they if they're asking you questions about them. Should I do this? Should I do that? It's important to ask questions about it. Um, but uh, um, and, and think about how to respond to those questions. So, similar to what the churches did for centuries on uh, on the baptism of infants, that was that was you know in part from questions that came up. But anyway. Um, Let's think about, I don't want to go too far down that road, because I really want us to. What happens if somebody gets one of my organs, and they're a sinner, and so when Christ comes back, I go up with them. Is that organ stuck down there? <laughs> or does it come with me? Yeah. I'm sorry. Let's remember the, I, let's remember the. Uh, I'm getting real tired right now, so I get a while. Sure. Well, let's remember the, let's remember the promises, which are so encouraging. It, in scripture, the promises of when Christ returns, the promises of the hope that we have. And the hope is not like, maybe this will happen. These will happen. They've been promised by God. These will happen. These are true. And the how and when and all that, but the promises. And why these promises are, um, are only those for believers, they're only true for believers. Um, and so stewarding them well, both in passing those down um, and uh, being aware of them in conversations with those who have not heard the gospel, that's really important to do. So with that, some practical implications. Proclaim, reflect, and teach the promised hope of the coming of our Lord. Proclaim it. Reflect upon it. It's encouraging to reflect upon it, isn't it? And teach it. Pass it down. Um, And uh, so Christ is central to this. Um, he's the one that, uh, by, um, by the assignment of God the Father and through the work of the Holy Spirit to convict people of the truth of the gospel, he's the one that accomplished it on the cross and in his resurrection. His incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and whenever it happens, his return, he's the one to accomplish it. So... Describing the accomplishments of the Lord in gospel proclamation and discipleship. Um, Remembering that he's to be spoken of for what he's accomplished for us. Of what he's going to accomplish when he returns. And then lift your head. When, uh, when you're getting discouraged about things going on in life, lift your head and remember the hope. Um, bow your head in remembrance. So pray with thankfulness for the promises and reflect what's to come. Think about it. Hmm? All right, any final thoughts? Seven forty-two. Not late. I was told seven forty-five. I hope that's right. (laughs) 
Father in heaven, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for the sending of your son. We thank you for the promises we have for the hope of what's to come. Um, and it's, uh, it's not ours to um, try and determine when that's going to be. It's not ours to determine the details of how those promises will be fulfilled, but just to hope and trust in the promises that have been, been revealed to us because um, you do not lie. Your promises will be fulfilled. And Lord, we, uh, um, we desire that as we await, Lord, that we'll be found faithful, that our, uh, our souls will be sober, our work will be of service to you, our desire to uh, persevere through suffering and to uh, confess our sins and for your spirit to do his work in us. Uh, help us with those things. And Lord, let us be a people that are full of hope that others will see that, that need your son that truly have no hope. Help us with that. We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen.